since Donald Trump took charge of the White House, his administration has been firm with Pakistan. But despite stern warnings, Pakistan has shown no signs of mending its ways. And despite its tough posturing, U.S. support in the form of aid continues to pour into Islamabad. Only this week, as a part of his budget plans, the U.S. president proposed giving more than $300 million in civil and military aid to Pakistan. Though observers say that Trump has been consistent, at least in his rhetoric, they point out that his actions have fallen short. On the plus side, though, it's not just the U.S. president now. Others in Washington are also speaking out against America's old ally, Pakistan. Dan Coates, the director of national intelligence in the Trump administration, went on record yesterday about his department's latest worldwide threat assessment report. The purpose of this report is to arm American lawmakers and policy experts with the intelligence they need to create new laws and policies. And Pakistan features prominently in this year's report. Court sees the expansion of Pakistan's nuclear arsenal as a threat. The report says that new nuclear missiles and weapons pose a risk to escalation dynamics and security in this region. But there's another point of concern for courts, and that is Pakistan's continued support for terrorists on its soil. This is what he said. Based militant groups continue to take advantage of their safe haven to conduct, att to conduct attacks in India, in Afghanistan, including U.S. interests therein. Pakistani military leaders continue to walk a del delicate line. In the last month, the administration has designed, uh, excuse me, designated eight militants affiliated with the Taliban, Haqqani Network, and other Pakistani militant groups. And we assess that Pakistan will maintain ties to these militants while re uh, restricting counterterrorism cooperation with the United States. The head of United States intelligence community also says that the steps being taken by the Trump administration are just not enough to contain Pakistan. But the U.S. government is working behind the scenes to put more pressure on Islamabad. The Trump administration has filed a motion to put Pakistan on a global terrorist financing watch list, which is maintained by the United Nations terror financing watchdog. This motion is likely to be discussed during the plenary session of the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, which begins on the 21st of February. If it goes through, Pakistan will be named and shamed before the global community for not taking sufficient measures to counter money laundering and terror financing. And it will be more difficult for Pakistan and more expensive to get foreign funding. Four days from today, an Indian delegation is expected to attend preliminary meetings in Paris on this. The aim of these meetings will be to build consensus against Pakistan. Islamabad obviously has begun lobbying against this move, but for now it seems its cosmetic efforts to impose technical bans on terror outfits uh, of the likes of Hafiz Saeed may not be enough to prevent the international embarrassment it faces. The world knows that such bans are not even worth the paper they're printed on. To Prime Minister Narendra Modi's West Asia outreach, India is now set to host President Hassan Rouhani of Iran. Connectivity and energy security will be high on the agenda as Prime Minister Modi holds talks with Rouhani over the weekend. Why is this visit significant and what does India hope to achieve from it? Vyond Ramesh Ramachandran reports. It is seldom that the President of Iran travels abroad and more seldom still that an Iranian leader visits India. This week, Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India hosts President Hassan Rouhani. Rouhani's visit to Hyderabad and New Delhi is only the third visit to India by an Iranian head of government in the last 15 years. His predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, visited India in 2008 and Mohammad Khatami was chief guest at India's Republic Day celebrations in 2003. Rouhani's visit takes place within days of Prime Minister Modi concluding a whirlwind tour of the Arab world and the Gulf and one month after New Delhi rolled out the red carpet for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. India and Iran enjoy civilizational ties. The two countries shared a border till 1947. Iran is among the top suppliers of crude oil to India. Importantly, India continued to engage with Iran at the time of sanctions. Iran is a priority in India's strategic calculus insofar as connectivity with Afghanistan, Central Asia and beyond is concerned. When the Indian Prime Minister visited Tehran in 2016, 
the transport ministers of India, Iran and Afghanistan signed a trilateral transit agreement in the presence of Modi, Rouhani and President Hashraf Ghani of Afghanistan. Also signed on the occasion was an agreement on the development of Chabahar port. India has committed 85 million US dollars for equipping the port which benefits India and the landlocked Afghanistan in transshipment of goods and essential commodities including most recently a consignment of wheat from India to Afghanistan via Iran. Chabahar helps India and Afghanistan overcome the handicap of Pakistan denying overland transit through its territory. It is also an integral element of the International North-South Transport Corridor which links South Asia with Eurasia. Iran's Transport Minister Abbas Ahmad Akhundi has told Vion that the Chabahar port project remains on course to meet India's deadline of becoming fully operational by the end of this year. Uh, discussed uh, with uh, one uh, Indian uh, company just uh, for operation. Uh, our negotiation was uh, is finalized, and uh, I hope that uh, we can sign it up uh, and a an interim uh, contract just uh, in this uh, January and uh, hand in the uh, port to them. So uh, I'm I'm very hopeful and uh, very optimistic that uh, we can operate with the uh, Indian company very soon. Chabahar is in the vicinity of the Gwadar port in Pakistan, which a Chinese state-run company will operate on a 40-year lease. The so-called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPEC is an offshoot of China's Belt and Road Initiative. The $60 billion project extends from China's Xinjiang province to Pakistan's Balochistan province, culminating in the Gwadar port overlooking the Arabian Sea. India views the Gwadar port with suspicion. It sees Chinese presence at Gwadar, Hambantota in Sri Lanka, in Kyaupyu in Myanmar as part of a strategy to encircle India. One outstanding issue though is that of the Farzad B gas field. India and Iran are still to come to an agreement on the award of contract for development of the gas field to Indian oil companies. New Delhi and Tehran could also compare notes on the status of Indian national Kulbushan Jadav, who India says was kidnapped in Iran and produced in Pakistan. India is fighting the case at the International Court of Justice at The Hague. Ramesh Ramachandran, we on. These last six months have been the coming of age of India's West Asia diplomacy in exchange by the Indian and Israeli Prime Ministers. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Palestine and the upcoming visit of Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. And with each visit, India has managed to step over numerous fault lines in the region. In July 2017, Narendra Modi became the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Israel and thus began the modi bb bromance, which translated into deeper ties between the two countries. From collaborating in the supply and manufacturing of sophisticated defense equipment to working together in the innovation and cybersecurity space, India and Israel have come a long way. And it only took six months for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to reciprocate and to visit India. Such deep ties with Israel command a balancing act of sorts. And so, last week, Prime Minister Modi went to Palestine. A visit to Palestine has little to do with the usual bilateral exchanges of purchasing arms or boosting trade ties. It's more about sending a message that India will dehyphenate ties between Palestine and Israel. And for New Delhi, it is also an opportunity to emerge as a potential peace broker in West Asia. Look at the situation with the U.S. President Donald Trump recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. America can no longer claim the position of an impartial mediator. It never was to begin with. But now the Palestinians reject their mediation and India then emerges as a viable alternative. This strategic maturity is only bolstering India's case. Five days after visiting Ramallah and calling Yasser Arafat one of the world's greatest leaders, Prime Minister Modi will host one of Israel's biggest enemies, if not the biggest now, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. Even while Iran has been slapped with international sanctions, India retains robust trade ties with that country. Iran is India's fourth largest oil supplier, but the relationship has not been without tensions. The elephant in the room is the pressure on Iran from Washington to abandon its nuclear plans. And on this tricky issue as well, India has all its bases covered. 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi and US President Donald Trump have struck an unlikely friendship after the Indian Prime Minister's visit to Washington last year. The first daughter has come to India and ties between the two countries have only deepened. Trump has appointed Indian origin men and women in key government positions and toned down threats against H-1B visa holders. This flurry of visits in under one year is a reflection of Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy. For the benefit of India, he has been able to deal individually with different countries, even if they are at loggerheads with each other. But coming back to the Iranian president, the man who's visiting, Hassan Rouhani is considered a moderate leader, bridging a pragmatic approach with the ideals of the Iranian revolution of 1979. Rouhani has managed to pull Iran out of the diplomatic isolation it once faced. Our next report introduces you to the man at the helm and recounts his journey to the pinnacle of power in Persia. Moderation and prudence was the slogan on the back of which Hassan Rouhani stormed to power in a keenly contested election in 2013, revamping an administration which was full of hardliners who had been handpicked by the former president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was no easy task. But Rouhani wasn't an outsider in the corridors of power in the deeply conservative state. Hassan Rouhani has been an important player in Iran's political setting right from the days of the revolution. He was an influential leader during the Iran-Iraq war in 1980-88 to and held several important positions in the defense establishment of Iran's post-revolution regime. In the difficult period of the post-war scenario in 1989, Hassan Rouhani was appointed as the Secretary of the Supreme National Security Council. He also served as the Deputy Speaker of the Iranian Parliament from 1996 till 2000. However, it was as the negotiator of Iran's nuclear program that Rouhani would shine through for his approach of moderation. So when Rouhani seized power in 2013, one of his key campaign promises was to end the isolation of his country. Iran was considered a rogue state. Pursuing a nuclear bomb to give itself regional clout, the pariah state was under crippling sanctions which had pushed the Iranian economy into freefall. But in 2015, Rouhani struck a nuclear deal with the United States under Barack Obama and five other world powers. Iran agreed to open up all its nuclear facilities for inspection. In return, the crippling economic sanctions were lifted. However, the change of guard in the White House threatens to unravel the Iranian nuclear deal. President Donald Trump, throughout his campaign and then after his election, maintained that this was the worst ever deal negotiated by the United States. He's been threatening to pull out of it ever since. The other five countries which are also signatories to the deal, France, Russia, Britain, China and Germany, have been urging Trump to uphold it. Amid this rhetoric, Rouhani was voted to power for a second term in May 2017, but the honeymoon was short-lived. His approach of moderation and pragmatism has brought few results domestically. He's faced protests and a backlash from the more hardline elements, and despite being a popularly elected leader, he remains subservient to the supreme leader of Iran, Sayyid Ali Hosseini Khamenei. Rouhani's second stint as president has been marred by protests. Despite the economic sanctions being lifted by the West, Iran last December witnessed widespread unrest due to galloping inflation and unemployment. The Iranian government blamed the CIA in cahoots with the Saudis and Israel of having orchestrated the protests. There was much speculation. Some said that the fundamentalists were getting back at him. Others insisted that the former president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was behind the protests which spread to many cities. Almost simultaneously, Iran also witnessed protests from several women against the law that mandates the hijab. Vida Mohaved became a symbol of protest against the directive that the hijab for women is compulsory in public spaces. When she stood atop a utilities box on a popular avenue holding a headscarf on a stick, it's safe to predict that Iran hasn't seen the last of these protests. For his emphasis on moderation, Hassan Rouhani has been described as the diplomatic sheikh. His skill is being put to the test by a belligerent American president, hostile neighbors and protesters on the streets of Tehran. Bureau report, we on. To Israel now, Benjamin Bibi Netanyahu was termed too inexperienced a politician when he was elected as the youngest prime minister of Israel in 1996, more than 20 years back. His transition from captain of an elite Israeli commando unit to a seasoned politician has now spanned over two decades. And during this course, 
he has positioned himself as a shrewd politician, discrediting his opposition and gaining a stronghold, both in politics and popular perception. He's not shy from calling himself the protector of Israel, promising stability to his countrymen in turbulent times. But all is not well with Mr. Netanyahu. Take a look at this report. Almost a decade ago, Benjamin Netanyahu, then the leader of opposition in Israel, went ahead with a vociferous campaign against Prime Minister Ehud Olmer, seeking his resignation on grounds of corruption. And 10 years later, life seems to be coming full circle for Bibi. Israeli police have recommended an indictment for the commando turned Prime Minister in multiple graft cases. Netanyahu has been charged with asking for positive coverage from a news publication with a tacit understanding of reining in a rival firm. He and his wife, Sarah, are also accused of receiving gifts to the tune of $280,000 from Hollywood mogul Arnon Milken. He has also allegedly been shard with luxury commodities like cigars, jewels and designer clothes from Australian billionaire James Packer. Netanyahu, on his part, remains defiant and has brushed aside these grave allegations. In a 10-minute long televised address, he made his intentions amply clear. Netanyahu has earned the epithet of the magician for his ability to tide over the most difficult challenges that come his way. It remains to be seen whether he will manage to pull a rabbit out of the hat this time around as well. We are report. We are. Now to another leader. He's been in power ever since white minority rule ended in 1994. And now the man who once shared the Robben Island prison with Nelson Mandela, South Africa's president, Jacob Zuma, is refusing to bow out despite a deadline to quit. Will he defy his party and stay on in power for another few months? Take a look at this. The NEC decided as follows. One, to recall uh, his deployee, Comrade Jacob Zuma, in accordance with Rule 12, to Rule 12.2.21.2 of the ANC Constitution, which are caused the NEC the authority to recall his deployees. And with that, the fate of another African strongman got sealed, or so it seemed. But a day after he was asked to go, Jacob Zuma, the 75-year-old veteran of the anti-apartheid movement, was refusing to step down. His party was forced to issue another ultimatum. We are now proceeding with, as the chief whip, to proceed with the motion of no confidence tomorrow in Parliament. Um, if the presiding officers can can feature that in, uh, <coughs> so that uh, President Zuma is then removed. So. The South African president, who faces scores of corruption allegations, has survived over half a dozen no-confidence votes in parliament in the past. But according to analysts, the options really are very limited for Zuma this time. Well, his options are either to, to accept the recall instruction and to resign as president, um, that's quite a simple uh, thing. He, on the other hand, he can decide not to accept the recall um, instruction, uh, and that then places the, the ANC in a, in a position where they have to decide what to do. Uh, and if they want to proceed to remove him as president, the only way they can do it is through parliament. And uh, the simplest way there would be to do that through a vote of no confidence, where they need a simple majority of the members of parliament. The ruling party is seeking to advance the date of the no trust vote so it does not have to join hands with the opposition revolutionary economic freedom fighters which it sought a trust vote on February 22nd. This is a significant moment um, and uh, you know we'll see whether the President Zuma decides to fall on his sword um, or whether he drags it out and comes to the ignominious end which is having Parliament beat him out. So. There is a sense of unease about the President's next move. Neither his party nor the man on the street wishes to see him cling on to power and inflict further damage to the economy. 
so happy. Zuma placed South Africa in a very, very bad situation. We are facing recessions because of Zuma. There's a lot of corruption going on because of Zuma. He must just step down. New party leader Cyril Ramaphosa is waiting in the wings, ready to replace Zuma as president. But will the politician with nine lives survive yet again? Bureau Report, we on.